is called tilting the odds. So just going to leave a little bit of information up there um, first for some of you just to get to know who I am. So again, the performance coaching I do is, um, as I say, it's with investment professionals right the way through from individuals in hedge funds, investment banks, energy firms, asset management, down to retail traders, some of them very experienced, some of them very new in the job. Uh, my website is called alpharrcubed.com. I also have a podcast called the Alpha Mind Podcast, where we have conversations with people from the world of financial markets, again, covering traders and investors, analysts, authors, coaches, psychologists. So it covers a broad range, but really focusing on the psychology of trading and um, also a Twitter handle there, Alpha Mind 101. Um, if people want to follow me on there. And I've I've left my uh, my email up there as well, stephen.goldstein at alpharrcube.com, just in case anyone wishes to get in contact with me. And I, I, I will show this information again towards the end. But uh, I'm going to go on uh, on live now so you can actually see me. I'm, I'm here in London. So it's quite late in the evening here for us. It's, uh, it's 11 o'clock at night. Um, so if my voice sounds a little bit rough it's because it's uh, it's towards the end of the day so i'm with you for the next next 55 minutes the title of my presentation is called tilting the odds and what do i mean by that and i really mean about trying to improve the odds of you succeeding in trading or investing um as we know it's an incredibly hard hard thing to achieve to get the odds on your side um, it's normally against you. And I'm going to take you through some uh, some diagrams I use when I'm working with people that really bring my ideas to life. But they're quite top level, sort of um, top down, so I won't be able to go into too much detail. Um, but I'm going to start with, I'm going to just bring my whiteboard into this. So as we say, I'm not going to be doing a, a slideshow. I'm going to keep it live. And I'm going to be uh drawing some images for you or some uh what i call metaphors for you which kind of bring my concept to life so i'm just trying to bring it in your in your field of vision and you're gonna have to put up with some of my drawing which isn't necessarily the best way and i'm gonna i'll give it some explanation as i'm doing it um so we have our axes one which represents performance and one which represents time and I want to show you an example of how I mean tilting the odds and again when we talk about it in terms of trading psychology trading mindset trading behavior so I'm going to talk about a specific example of uh, what happened when a client came to me about four years ago and this was a hedge fund client came to me been in a hedge fund for about three years and he was very disappointed with his performance which over those three years had averaged about four percent now this individual was a, a sharp player he'd been an investment banker for 12 years very successful in the investment bank as a macro trader where he worked and he was disappointed with his performance in his fund they were disappointed with him and his description of, of the challenge that he faced was if I don't make it this year, if I don't start improving this performance this year, I don't think I'm going to be around much longer. So one of the things this individual did was keep very, very diligent records of every trade idea he had, um, how he wanted to represent those trade ideas, uh, where he was, how he would have planned to run them, uh, where, he would have got out where he would have taken profit um, the various unfolding scenarios so using all that data that he had those records i said to him why don't you try and rebuild your book over the last three years as if you'd theoretically taken every single one of those trades had you done it what would have been the performance so he took some time away and he came back to me and he said over the three years, I would have averaged 40% return, around 40% return, had I achieved, had I done everything I said I was going to do. And it would have been with better 
better volatility matrix. So it would have been less higher sharp ratio, less volatility. Um, now again, this is this this is purely just a metaphor, but these were approximately his numbers. So you can see what he's actually achieved over three years, average performance, and what he should have achieved had he followed his strategy and his plan. And this difference, which I'm going to highlight in red here, effectively was money left on the table. This was what he was unable to claim or was losing as a result of his inability to execute what he said he was going to do. And there's lots of people use various terms to describe this. We could call it the behavioral gap. We could call it an output gap. But essentially, it's an inability to follow your plan, stay with your ideas, stick to your strategy, lots of different areas. And we all have this. If I'm honest, and as, as he was honest as well, the reality was that was a little bit of a dream, trying to achieve 40%. Um, some of the risk rules in the fund, some of the restrictions on him probably meant that he wouldn't have been able to do that in reality. But he certainly believed that somewhere in the middle, maybe 15 to 20%, which would have definitely put him in the top players in that fund um, over these three years, he was certainly capable of achieving. So really the purpose was to try and shift his performance upwards. That is what we have to try and do when I work with someone as a coach. And we have to try and explore what is holding him back, what is causing him to do this, what is causing him to behave like this. And the difference is purely pretty much it's down to the psychological factors of trading. Our fears, um, our, 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 perhaps our greed, our inability to, as we say, follow the plan, inability to execute the strategy, lots of different aspects and this is an area i've worked on for many years so if i could just explain a little bit more about myself um, i work as a coach now and i have worked as a coach for the past 10 years before that i was a trader for nearly 25 years i worked for various investment banks here in the uk uh, credit suisse being one of them commerce bank the german bank being another one and the back in arm of American Express. And my roles varied sometimes from being a market maker in interest rate and foreign exchange products and, and fixed income to being a propriety trader. Uh, and, and I kind of went through my own experience of this as well as a trader. My, my latter years were far more successful. I shifted the odds. That was after going through coaching myself roughly halfway through, through my career. Um, but the, lo the last 10 years, I've been working as a coach on the other side of the curtain. And I've done quite a lot of studying in the area of, uh, of, I suppose you could say, psychotherapy more than anything. I'm not a qualified psychotherapist, but the coaching methods and philosophies which I adhere to, to draw on various aspects of psychology, psychotherapy, behaviour, those fields. And from that, I've developed a model which I use to try and help my clients and people that I work with understand the risk process. Because at the end of the day, it's a risk process failure. That's what's happening. And it's the human aspect of the risk process. So I'm gonna move on to that now and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and draw this out for you. Um, so again, I'm gonna just look at the area that you're looking at to try and understand that. And I'm going to try and draw a circle. Now, normally when I do this, I draw a very bad circle. And as you can see, it's gone very badly indeed. It's, it's very late at night, so you're going to have to bear with me. Let me try and do a, a slightly better circle. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to draw it up. I'm just going to leave a little gap at the bottom. And this circle represents a cycle of what we go through on a human level and a physical level as we go through the risk process. So you're going to have to bear with me because I'm trying to going to try and explain the risk process and what I mean by this using this. So to help this metaphor, it will help just to do a very, very simple explanation of a simple, a single, one-off single trade. 
you buy a trade or you, or you follow the market and you do something similar, simple like maybe buy some S and B S and P futures or or sell euro dollar or buy gold, whichever whichever market you're in. So try and think it in terms of this. I'm just going to move it back a bit, and you're going to have to bear with me as I try and explain this out to you. And as I do, I would try and add some detail and colour which you'll bring to life. But I want you to think of the first part of the risk process as represented by this area here. And this area is, so, so imagine you've come into, you've, you've not been in the market for six months or a year, you've taken six months, a year off, you've not followed the market at all, you have no idea what's happening, you, you've been, I don't know, trekking through the jungle, whatever it is, you're just not in contact with what's going on in the market. And then you come back in and you're going to start trading again. So what happens is the first thing you do is to try and sense and scan the market. Okay, and, the, and you're doing this mostly unconsciously. You're watching the market, you're watching the price action, you're, you're reading research, you're following the news, you're following events, you're spending some time watching this. And, and all the time you're doing that, you're being curious about what's happening and, and trying to generate ideas. And I use an a, a analogy here of a satellite dish receiver to represent this process where our curiosity are the questions that we're asking and that we're looking at and that sends out signals and you get signals back. You get messages coming back from the market to you, to the satellite dish in your head. Now, as you spend more time sensing and scanning and being curious, eventually something will pop up on your on your screen, on your radar signal in your head. Something that gets your curiosity. That you need to know more about. It may be an opportunity, an idea. It may be a threat. Um, but something, something grabs your attention, a signal, and you want to look more into it. So that's the first part here. That's the first time you're really consciously aware of something, whatever it is. And let's just say it's maybe an S&P future. You're watching the S&P futures and you think, based on all your beliefs and your knowledge, I'm curious about this, it's something interesting. So you start doing the next stage of the process. And this is really the first conscious stage of the process for you. So I'm going to just draw it up to here. And this is called sense making. So whatever that signal was, you need to make sense of it. You need to make meaning from that. Because if it's going to become an opportunity for you, you need to try and understand it a little bit further. So there we go through the sense making process. And what you're doing is you're trying to form a narrative. Because we always, everything we do, we form a narrative. We form stories inside our heads. Again, based off some of our beliefs, um, our ideas, our values. And it allows a story or a narrative to form. And that is what happens is you've now looked at the S&P market and, and don't worry about time on this. Just forget time for now. These processes can be seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, even months. It all depends on the time frame you're in. But something has popped up for you and you've made sense of it. And now you're looking in, the, in terms of this S&P idea. You're thinking, I fancy buying this. I think this is going higher. That's that's what you've made sense of it. Could be that you think it's going lower. Doesn't really matter. This is just an example. That's what's happened through the sense making process. But you can't just put it on. You need to know whether there's value here. Can you make something out of this? Can you? Is there a risk reward? Does it fit your strategy? Does it fit your process? Um, is there an opportunity here that's worth going into? So you, you now conceptualize, which is the second part of the blue area. And I use blue for a reason. Um, and I'll tell you that soon, it'll become apparent soon. But in this part here, we're now trying to work out, is there a way we can represent this? We can trade this, we can put this on and how are we gonna do it? So really it's now creating some sort of plan. You probably can't see that, it's a little bit too high. A route from A, to be and how are we going to get there again i might need to go a little bit further back we'll tilt this up okay so how do we get from a to b so the plan 
that we're going to put into place is formed in this stage and is it worth it of course is it worth me doing that is there enough juice in it is there enough value on the upside does that compensate sufficiently for the risk does it fit with my structure you might be looking for 20 to 1 trades do you need to have quite a lot of upside compared to the downside you might be someone who's looking for just two to one up trades um, or even even trades it's based on momentum could be based on value it doesn't really matter could be a technical trade fundamental but does it fit how you look at the market and the final part of this is you putting together some sort of plan that if it is a trade you want to take this is how you're going to do it now this side of the circle of the risk process is of course at this stage purely theoretical you haven't got any skin in the game at this stage and I like to use another analogy you might be noticing I use quite a lot of these and it's the analogy of a tightrope walker or, or, or a walker on a beam a four inch beam and when you've got no skin in the game it's quite easy to cross that beam there's very little danger if it's just two feet off the ground just two feet off the ground all you're going to do is fall and get back up again so again I don't know if you can see that very little skin in the game this side the worst thing is that if you don't do it you miss out and I'll come back to that in a minute this is where it starts to get interesting because at this point in the process this is where we move to action this is the act we move from planning and preparation to actually engaging and I'm gonna just color this side and red I use red because this is what I would call a hot state. Now, as long as you tell you have the risk on, tell you end the risk, you are in a hot state. What do I mean by that? You are raising that tightrope level, as you can see there, or, or that beam, that beam analogy, and we're raising it to 200 feet off the ground. Again, a very bad drawing, but now you're climbing up there and you're heading to 200 feet off the ground. And the danger, the risk is very real. If you fall, game over. Of course, the reality is we have safety nets and we have harnesses, but even then we're not comfortable being 200 feet off the ground. We don't want to fall. We have a natural dislike for heights. Um, we're no guarantee the safety net or the harness is going to hold. Maybe it's not a chance we really want to take until it has to happen. So, you are now in a hot state because trading doesn't happen two feet off the ground. Sim trading does, but real trading happens 200 feet in this analogy. It happens 200 feet in the air and your mind is not going to be the same. doesn't matter how accomplished you are. You can walk two feet off the ground. You get all the technique and theoretically the technique is the same at two feet off the ground as it is at 200 feet off the ground. In reality, your mind will not let that technique go the same way. You will not, you, you'll be a lot more cognizant of your foot placement, of the danger, of the risk. There'll be a lot more fear there. There'll be a lot more anxiety. And that is what's happening. And that's what happens on this side. We are in a hot state. We are in an emotional state. Now, this is the point. You cannot help having emotions. You are not in control of that. No one can. We're human. Okay, and you hear often try try and avoid having emotions, try and suppress them, try and just pretend they don't exist. And that's like trying to pretend that your shadow doesn't exist when you're standing in the sunshine. It's impossible. We are emotional beings, we will always have emotions. And, and you're better off trying to recognize that and work with that. Of course, you can engage in emotional management. And that's part of this. If you recognize your emotions, it's easier to manage them. The emotions are in a hot state this side. But your emotions will be changing everything. Like we say, up there at 200 feet, you're not going to cross that rope. Now, as you noticed, I said there's no skin in the game here. There's skin in the game here. This side, I use blue because it's cold state. This is the analysis. This is the preparation, the planning. This isn't the game though. This is the game. This whole bit here is the game. 
that it's not a game at all it's the theory okay this is where most people go wrong they think this is the game they think you need to be good at analysis you need to be good at finding a strategy your system yes they all matter of course but they don't matter at all if you don't get this right if you're strong on this side then you've got a chance now most people spend all their effort and energy learning techniques learning analysis developing a strategy that they think is going to work but it's pointless if you cannot execute it it's meaningless so we say this is the game this is what the winners are doing they're great on this side so move into action now i'm gonna just make a point here so much damage is done between there and there failure to execute your plan and maybe your plan is just not realistic perhaps you've got a plan for two feet off the ground and really you need to have a plan for 200 feet off the ground you know if you plan to put a certain amount of risk on the reality you can't run there's no point planning to put that much risk on you need to develop that skill i mean it's it's just not going to happen so what's going to happen is you're going to hesitate or you're going to avoid it or you're going to do something you're going to wait for confirmation and what's happening then is you're now doing something differently to your strategy as was this individual here he wasn't executing we're going to get rid of that bad circle he wasn't executing that strategy which was his plan he was executing a different strategy he so wanted to be certain that he was right that he waited for confirmation or he waited for a better entry when his plan was for an entry here that was the theory now think about that for a second let's just imagine that you have a a, a particular approach where you try to have uh, you try and win five times what you're willing to lose now of course if you wait for that confirmation to happen and then of course what happens often let's say you have a breakout strategy and you wait for the breakout to be confirmed often the price is a lot higher by then so that five to one now might only be two to one or three to one now just think about that for a second everyone's strategy is a mixture of wins and losses that's what there is you will have you might have just a couple of wins in your strategy that are big and many small losses or you might have lots of small wins in there and lots of small losses or bigger losses even but the sum total of these on this side the pluses as an aggregate is greater than the minuses okay and that relationship is going to be affected by failure to execute so let's say you miss a few or you make them smaller than they should be then your strategy which is formed off that is gone you're not playing that game you're not doing that strategy and that comes from failure to execute there failure to enter the first part then failure to run the risk so if this is the entry side this is where you're actually now in contact you're on the rope and then if you're not running that in the way you should be for your strategy that's also going to go wrong that's also affecting these pluses and minuses so if you think about it we all are human we all have emotions we all question ourselves we all have doubts um, one of the beauty of what i do since i left trading and became a coach is i have hundreds and hundreds thousands of hours of conversations with traders and they come from right across the spectrum so my clients are in some cases they're investment managers hedge fund managers hedge fund owners pms asset managers guys who run family offices where they're trading in the largest portfolio of anyone i've ever ever coached is a yard of dollars i've got a lot of hedge fund managers that are running anywhere from between a quarter of a, a quarter of a yard to half a yard of dollars um smaller bigger right down to retail traders across all markets um equities energy commodities fixed income macro relative value stars 
and everyone is telling me these same things they're telling me what is going on during this phase and they struggle they struggle at the entry phase they struggle during the middle phase because then we start to doubt ourselves. again that's human nature you're all emotional everyone will doubt yourself at some point it's just because you're human there is a there is actually a, a name for for that uh that try to i think it's called the cancer syndrome or something like that where whenever we do a project at some point we will doubt ourselves even if it's just for a second we will question ourselves do we believe in it or not and if you allow that to control you and to affect your trading again you're not going to follow this part you're not going to run the risk as you planned um, so again you're going to change the balance between minuses and pluses from not doing that now uh, this is incredibly difficult to do because the other side of it is we're dealing with markets which are near random that that's that's the challenge here so you will get situations if you theoretically try and run your strategy you will get situations which you will appreciate you've all been there where they nearly hit your profit target don't quite get there and then they become losses and you don't want that to happen next time so you start taking your profit you don't want to lose that but equally you'll have losses that nearly hit your very nearly get to your stop loss and they don't quite and they would become profits if you didn't tinker with them or change them and your entire strategy is almost certainly based off the idea of the pluses and minuses but again trying to stick to these when your emotions are firing is incredibly hard this is why it's so important to to have an approach or style that's congruent to your personality a lot of people mess up because they're not trading a strategy or system or haven't developed or evolved a strategy or system that suits them or they're trading somebody else's playbook if you're not trading your own playbook everyone at some point should be playing a playbook that suits them and in most cases you have to form one around your personality your style your fears how you see the world um, so you involve that over time so now we go through this stage here this is the the risk stage entry actually running the risk and then disengaging and again a lot goes wrong here as we said if you don't try to get to your your profit and then you change the entry you disengage at the wrong rates you take a loss when it didn't hit your stop loss all your rules for getting out it doesn't have to be a stop loss if you're running some sort of macro trade or, or relative value trade but whatever it is you need some sort of rules of engagement that are kind of in the strategy in the plan now you only have two possible outcomes at the end you've either made money or you've lost money they don't necessarily mean you've done well or they haven't and a lot of people go wrong here as well so if you're ever winning out if you do your strategy wrong if you execute your process wrong but you had a good outcome it's going to tempt you to do that same wrong thing again on the other hand if you have a bad outcome but you did everything right that's also going to tempt you to change it unless you stick to it this is why it's so important to remember where these pluses and minuses come from this is why people say go with the process judge the process not your outcomes not your results now we haven't got to the most important part for me of this process yet you might think okay we've disengaged that's the end of this process ah uh, not yet the green by the way represents one of mostly unconscious processes so the penult this is the penultimate part of the process okay and this is the super skill great traders and i'll tell you why so you physically engage there but you don't mentally disengage so you, you physically disengage but you don't mentally disengage and mental disengagement is the key that's letting go that's closing and we talk about this whether you have a good outcome or a bad outcome which is why it's really important to know what you're which of these you're doing uh, by the way if anyone's got any notes or questions as we're doing this feel free to drop it in the chat box there i should have mentioned that um, this for me is a super skill great traders 
I've, I've worked with some extraordinary individuals over the years. Um, okay, a yard, sorry, thank you. A yard is a billion. Sorry, it's uh, maybe I'm not, I'm, I'm not being uh, as straight. So when I worked in the markets, if someone did a billion, we'd call it a yard. I, I don't even know why. Um, so if I talk about a trader who's right, a PM who's running a yard of dollars, he's running a billion dollars of assets under management capital. Uh, half a yard, obviously 500 million. So he might have, um, his capital is allocated to him by the fund. It's $500 million. Um, and I'll tell you a story about letting go or closure that gives you a sense of it. Um, one of my worst trading years followed one of my best trading years. I'd had, I'd made a lot of money in one particular year. We'd hit a big bear market. I'll tell you how long ago this was, 1994. We had a big bear market in the bond market. I'd done spectacularly well. Um, my ego was flying. I'd been praised by my bosses. They said, Steve, we want you to join a new prop team that we're starting, a prop trading team. You know, it, my head couldn't get out the door. That's That was kind of what was happening, you know, for several months. Uh, my ego was, it'd been inflated. I thought I was the king. I felt like I was the king. Good outcomes could do that to you. And the outcome of that year was very good. I never let go of that. You, you, you have an attachment to good outcomes and bad outcomes. It's very difficult because this, this emotional stretch here creates an attachment, an emotional attachment. There's nothing much we can do about that. We can't really help that. Because like I say, we're human. But obviously, the quicker we can let go of that and move on, which is what this final part is, this is moving on, you need to move on to start again. And as I said, the important thing about this process is you must always go around the entire process in everything you do. You must never short circuit it. You must never cut any of it out. You must go through it properly. So what happens when I didn't let go? My ego was too big. I jumped straight from there to there. Curiosity is the key to this. Many of the great traders I've mentioned, they are, they are constantly curious. I turned off curiosity because of my ego. I thought I knew what was going on. I thought I knew what the market was going to do. And it brought me down with a bang the following year. Completely caught out. Now, you could think about it that with a single trade, a short-term trade. You know, how often do we give money back after making money? Because actually we get lax. We think we don't need to do this. We think we know what's going on. Now, equally, this happens after a bad trade, of course. A bad trade is even worse. Um, we have a really bad outcome, which we've probably had a negative outcome. Now, it may have been that we didn't make as much as we wanted. We didn't put as much risk on as we wanted. So it could even be from a good outcome. We took profit when actually we could have made a lot more. Or it could have been we, we, we took a loss cut when we never needed to, or we let a loss run. Whatever it is, there's a million ways to look at it. It may be you, you, you might have made less than one of your colleagues in there, or you some, some, some idiot on Twitter, you thought you've had a good day and he's, but he's made, he's made uh, $10,000 and you've made 500. By the way, don't believe those guys on Twitter. Just try and, even if they're right, just assume they're not, because 99.9% .9 of them are liars. Um, what I mean by that is they're the same as the guys that you know who go to casinos, who we all used to know, used to tell us when they run, but they never tell you when they lose. And they would exaggerate their, their wins as well. Um, so the letting go, if you can't let go, your mind is disturbed. Your mind is challenged. So I'm thinking of a trader a few years ago. And by the way, this is a, this is a constant battle. Okay, we don't get over it just because, you know, we think I've been doing this 20 years. It happens to people who've been doing it 30, 40 years. I know that because I speak to them. You know, guys who come to me, they're in their fourth decade of trading and they're saying, I'm still screwing up. <laughs> yeah, I, I, am I ever going to get this fully right? No is the answer. You're never going to get it fully right. So it's impossible to perfect. It's always changing. The markets are always changing. You know, it, it is a constant, 
you know, heads, you know, screws the head. So we're always fighting this and we're always fighting ourselves and our emotion. One trader came to me a few years ago, a little bit like this guy, actually not, not, he was a really good trader, but he got into a really bad run. And I said to him, what happened? He said, well, I said the market was going down. I said, I think it was dollar yen at the time was going a lot lower. Dollar yen went a lot lower. So I said, well, what happened then? And he said, I lost money. I said, hold on, you've been, you've been bearish on dollar yen for months. Dollar yen's collapsed. And tell me what happened. And he said, well, yep, yeah, I got short. And I'll give you a kind of, show you roughly what happened. So kind of imagine it was like this kind of pattern. So he kind of got short about here. But he went short too much. He put too much on. And it did one of these where it just kind of faked up like that very sharply. And he's got nervous because he's got too much risk on, thinks I better just book a bit of profit. So he takes a little bit and then it collapses. And now he's like, what an idiot I was. Let's go that way. That might be a better line. So he goes and resells it back down here eventually after watching it and watching it and watching it. He bites the bullet and he resells it back here. Then it does that and does that. And now he's in agony. This wasn't part of his plan. He hasn't gone back. He hasn't planned that. It's just gone straight back in and it's bounced up there. So he's cut out here. Nervousness, anxious, annoyed, angry. Too much risk on again. And it's done that. Got into this cycle several times over the next couple of months. Selling at the wrong point. He's totally out of sync with the market. Cuts up, cuts out, puts too much risk on. Terry's wiped out his entire year's profit over the next two months. And he was having a really good year at this time. Now, what he's doing is, first of all, he didn't follow his plan. He went in with too much risk. That was his big mistake to start with. He was so confident of it. He was having a good year. He's making more money. He decides to put a little bit more on. So first of all, he hasn't, he hasn't done that right. And then from that point onwards, he was fighting the challenge. Because as the market came back up and he's thinking, I don't want to give away what I've got because I've got more on than I wanted, he takes profit, which wasn't part of that plan either there. And then, as I say, what you have to do is you have to get mental closure. And that might take a short time. It might take a long time. But he never got that. And you have to go around the process. You have to think, do I get back in? Is this trade still on? Yep, it looks like it still is. I'm going to plan to get back in and I'll find the right level to go back in. And then I'll get back on the right move and run that through. That's what we saw about staying on the process. Okay. Actually, what he did is he short circuited it and went straight back to action without going through any of this. And this is a cycle he got because he just kept doing this. So he got caught in this horrendous cycle. You know, this is a, a, a top trader serious guy fx market got into a horrible loop gave back his entire year's profit in the end and what made it worse is is these losses occurred on a move he predicted and should have made a lot of money i'm sure all of you in some way have been there at some point now when i worked with him on this because it was in a pretty bad state when we had our next session I had to get him to get closure, mental closure. And it wasn't easy. You know, he was really screwed up in his head. So we work on this. We talk about this. We explore this. He takes a week off from the market as well. He just wants to get away from the market. And then he comes back and he's ready to move on again. He's ready to start. And actually he finished the year really strongly. Had his, turned out he had his best year ever just based on the last three months. He got back in sync with the market got back on his process, not immediately, it took a while, started small to get his confidence up, followed his plan, and it went brilliantly. But this was an example of when you get into one of these loops, you don't get closure, you're stuck. It's almost like you can't get past that. Again, as I said, 
closure is this is the superpower of great trading of course you need to go through the moving on phase moving on again could be seconds could be weeks could be months sometimes depends how serious the issue is in the closure and again curiosity is vital if you don't move on you turn this off this process this risk process is sequential if that's turned off that is going to be compromised it's not going to be as good so when my ego was inflated and i went straight to there without being curious my sense making then was subpar suboptimal once my separate meetings my, my uh, once that's subpar my conceptualization conceptualizing is subpar that's subpar that's going to be subpar it's just going to follow unless i can get out this loop out this date this back into the full cycle and that actually happened that year i talked about having a very bad year yeah i completely misread the market because i wasn't doing that and i just went straight to that and it was it, it it went horribly wrong until the middle of the year when finally i've taken a bit of time out had a bit of a wake up call got back into it and eventually got back into the right loop it took a while you reduce size you stop for a bit you start small you get back into the right sequence you may be asking so why is letting go the secret for great traders I'll tell you a story and people who have listened to my podcast um may have heard me talk about this particular individual a couple of times so it was a trader who i was coaching and he was working this was in 2012 he was working for a, a us investment bank in the far east in hong kong and i'd been told he was the the best trader in the entire firm so you may wonder why did he have coaching I, I, why did he want coaching i wondered that as well it was because he was the best trader in the entire firm that's what great traders do they're always looking to get better it's part of their advantage they're not locked into their ego so when i met this individual he was almost egoless he did have an ego of course he did but he was so humble that it, it, it kind of took took me back a little bit because i expected the big swinging dick to walk in the trading room um he walks in i get to know him he's a brilliant trader and as i get to know him everything i'm hearing him talking about he's relating to poker and it turned out that he was a big poker player as well his weekends would be taking part in tournaments okay um in in asia okay so he'd go off to um macau every single weekend and he'd come back and he'd be saying okay a good weekend at the tournament and it turned out he was a world top 200 poker player now i didn't know this at the time but actually this is what i found out so as well as being a bank trader he was ranked in the world's top 200 poker players so i got into him about this i talked about this so you relate trading to poker you're absolutely the same it's the same thing of course there's differences but basically you're playing the same game so i said to him so what makes you so successful as a poker player i said you're in these tournaments you're playing with other poker players some of the best players in the world you all know the value of the hands the cards are dealt and distributed exactly the same what makes you better than these other guys so he said to me if i'm honest i walk away better than anyone else so i went well, what does that mean he went there's a bad hand if i have a bad hand i come back to the next hand i'm not disturbed by it if i have a bad night i come back the next day or the next week i'm not disturbed by it he said so many players go on to tilt so easily it's very hard to get me on to tilt i do go on to tilt sometimes but most of the time i can stay there i can stay the game so i walk away from the table with the hands a bad hand better than anyone else in other words i let go so he gave me another example he said imagine the cards are dealt randomly right that's what it is in poker how you play them isn't necessarily random it depends on the cards you get and how the players you're playing against but if you sit there for 2 hours at the table just getting bad cards at some point you're going to force yourself 
to do something that doesn't quite fit in with what you should do. You'll come off your process. You'll go into a tilt state. He said, I'm able to walk the table. I can leave the table at that point. That's what I do. He is better at letting go than anyone else. And he applies that same rule to his trading. Was he the best? Was he perfect at it? No. That was some of the things we worked on. He was the best that I've ever come across. So if I was to rate him on this side, I'd say he was probably seven out of 10. Most people that I meet, they're probably somewhere to two or three out of 10 on that side. Same with this side. We talk about the risk process. How are most people on this side? This isn't where they put their energy. Most people put their energy into that, planning the trade. Very few people put their energy and learning into how they take and manage risk and how they run it. As we say, this is the game. So most people I meet, they may be eight or nine on this side, okay, out of 10. They may be pretty good at predicting the market. Most people are. Most people are good at putting together a strategy. Very few people are strong at running this. Most people I know over time, I would again rate three to four out of 10 on this side. So the guys that get up to six or seven out of 10 regularly, they're the winners. These guys that raise the game on this side, they're the winners. This guy, this side, there's no skin in the game. This side, it's all about skin in the game. When I was, when I was a trader, I said for the first half of my career, I survived. I did okay. As I told you, I had a great year, then a bad year. And that was kind of quite consistent for the early part of my career. Second half of my career, I became aware that I actually wasn't that good on this side. I was good here. I wasn't great here. This is what I needed to work on. And I certainly wasn't that great there. I may have rated myself somewhere like three or four out of 10. Somewhere here, like two or three out of 10. Good enough to survive, good enough to get by. It wasn't gonna give me longevity unless I could improve it. Had to get that. And this is the thing, you only have to raise it a notch or two and you're suddenly moving up four or five. Rate this to three or four. A couple of years, raise it to five or six. This is the game. So when I talk about tilting the balance, tilting the odds, shifting the odds, this is what you have to work on. Raising your game a little bit. Stretching the strategy up. Closing, another word for this is closing the output gap. So if I think of another individual who I've worked with over many years, um, and you'll be able to read about this guy, by the way, he's in the new Market Wizards book, which comes out in November. He worked on his output gap. He looked back at all his trades. This is why keeping a diary, keeping a journal, keeping a record and reviewing it is so important. He decided one year to go back and look at all his trades and he found out only 5% of his trades counted for all his profits. So he wanted to find out what was the characteristics of those trades? What could he do better? How could he make sure that he stays away from some of these bad trades? Um, he's become a phenomenal individual, phenomenal trader. Like I say, he's in the next market business book. So you'll be able to read out about him. This model has a lot more details to it. Now I'm conscious of the time. We've got about seven minutes less to this. So I kind of want to throw out a couple of questions just to see what, if anyone has any thoughts about this, anything that's interesting to them, anything that you can, I saw a comment there from Danny C that he can relate to something. So is there anything about this that you're curious about or that is interesting to you? Anything that anyone has any questions? Just, just to mention, we're going to talk about whilst anyone's thinking there, or if they want to write any questions, this bit here. So each of these stages is absolutely vital. I was working with a client recently and we were looking about where he fails to take trades. When you do that, 
you just bypass that bit. That's one of those examples of short, short circuiting it. Um, any kind of, so someone's put a question up there. Any, well, some, someone said any kind of exercises or approach you use for the psychological. I think the, there's, there's a couple of things, but obviously journaling is one of the, it's the secret sources of many great traders. If, if you don't know what you're doing here, so this is a part of it, we don't really see ourselves doing this. You need to become more self-aware. You need to understand your risk process. You need to be able to compare it to something. So if you're keeping a journal, you will start to, over time, build up a record as if you had some sort of video. If you were to compare it to sports or performance, you have something to look back on. So I've got a list of old journal books, which I looked at, that which I've got there. But I used to keep notes of not everything I did, but some of the things I did. Now, one year I decided to start looking back over them to see, was there anything interesting that was useful to me to know? And I started finding some, a I found one particular trade, which was really interesting because I noticed the next couple of days, I had no comments about it. And I decided to look up at what the market did. And when I did that, I noticed that I hadn't executed what I said I was gonna do. In other words, I hadn't done that. I hadn't moved onto there as I planned. And actually what happened, I ended up chasing it and it became a trade which I should have made money of. I had the record of what the market did and actually I lost money on it. A little bit like that one. But there were other times and I was curious after that, I thought, would well, I have done this anywhere else? I wasn't even aware of this. And I started looking through it and I'd done similar things in loads of places. Made notes, not followed the plan and then either lost money, not made money or I just hadn't even executed the trade, missed opportunity. And, and, and often I was, when that happened, I was just going from there to there. And then I was just forgetting what I did. Somehow I was doing mental closure, but I wasn't using that mental closure process to look back and think what I'm doing. It was almost like I, I wasn't going through that. I was almost going back to there. So that was unhealthy because when you do that, you're not growing, you're not learning, you're not improving. Um, so, so journaling is not just making notes of everything. It's a proper serious process which can help you become more self-aware, more conscious of what you're doing, more able to check your process. Is this similar to the, so I've got a question here from David Boyle. Is this similar to the creative process, say design? Uh, it, it can be. I mean, I, I've gone through this same process here when I've worked with salespeople as well. I've gone through this same process in different things when I'm working with leaders and managers. You can do this when you're constructing, say, a strategy. And you actually put the strategy to work here. So you look at the bigger picture, the macro, not just the individual trade, but what's the, what's the overall thing doing? And then look back on it and try and get some sort of closure on it, sort of do some sort of post-mortem on it. So yeah, if that's what you mean, um, I should imagine it can be. But in, the, in this case, I just apply this to the trading process. But thank you for the question. I hope that was kind of what you wanted from that. Um, I'm very conscious we've just got a couple of minutes left. Anyone else got any questions you want to ask? I'm just going to go back to putting some information about me if anyone's interested. So again, if anyone wants to know anything about me, my details are on here, my Twitter handle on there. That's my website, that's my email, that's the podcast on the right hand side. And I think just, just checking any more comments, do you have this drawing in print anywhere? I do. And if you email me, I can send it through. Um, and I've got quite a few clients who have this now <laughs> in, in a proper print version on their screensaver. Uh, and they also have it plastered around their trading room as a reminder to keep examining this process. And we go through this time and time again. 
Uh, yep, the Alpha Mind podcast. We look at most aspects. We we look at the mindset of trading, um, but we 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 it, that is the psychology of money. Um, we get analysts, we get coaches on, we get ex-traders on. We talk about their trading. We sometimes get current traders on. Uh, we get authors. So it's all sorts of things, mostly about the mindset, the psychology, the performance aspect. But for me, the performance aspect, psychology, you can't separate it. Trading psychology shouldn't really be a separate subject from trading. It is trading. It's like trying to look at sports psychology as a separate subject from sport. It is sport. So thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious of the time. I'm going to end this conversation now. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you got some value from it. And we've got a couple more great speakers coming up. So I'm going to hand over to them. Thank you very much.